So today I'm going to be talking about six apps one code in Angular. Um, uh, my name is Sam Yusuf. So I'll talk a bit more about myself today uh, uh, in the next slide. Um, all right. So my name is Sam Yusuf. I am a software engineer and developer based in London. I'm originally Nigeria, but I live in England. Uh, I'm a of a small company called Hybrid, which is basically just me, myself, and I. You know, I just kind of get around the world and uh, do the things I like to do in tech. I'm a trainer and a software engineer, so I go around teaching people about IT and also writing some code that doesn't suck most of the time. Um, that's what I like to think. Uh, I love open source communities and I, like, I love growing communities, so I've traveled around the world and uh, around four continents actually help different communities, especially the Angular community and the Ionic community to really see what I can do. Uh, along that line, some books might come out, some courses might also do. Uh, I recently launched something called UI School, uh, so I'm the lead instructor there alongside my partner. And has anybody seen the Avatar movie? <laughs> yes. We have real people in the house. That is the best movie of all time. I don't care what you say. Like, if you do not agree with me, you're not allowed to sit with my talk. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, I love water sports. Uh, so yeah, if you want to get like, want to drown some time, just let me know where we can go. All right. So let's start today. So I guess where I will start my talk is by saying how the web is everywhere today. Like wherever you look, left, right, and center, you see the web. You know, you go on the mobile side, you see the web powering mobile applications and a lot of, of like mobile infrastructure. Uh, we go to traditional web applications, well, yeah, of course. Uh, traditional, uh, traditional web applications are powered by the web in different forms, back end, server side stuff. Uh, and when I say web, I like to just probably maybe quantify that a little bit. I, I normally mean HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you know, the standard um, sort of like web application um, te technologies that we're used to. Uh, and even standard desktop applications. So when I say standard desktop applications, I mean things like Dreamweaver and all these type of things that you can install on your computer or Mac, Linux. And the web is part of some of these things today. Um, Internet of Things. Uh, has anybody heard of Yuri Shekhet? Yuri Shekhet? Yuri Shekhet is like the god of IoT. Like, he, this guy is so crazy. This guy would create like an IoT model on Angular. Like, he goes as far as like designing his own module. Like, you should look him up. He's an interesting guy. But well, he's a friend of mine. You read your watching this. Uh, <coughs> and also server side. I feel like one of the reasons that made the web very accessible is when Node came to be. And Node now powers a lot of server side applications. So today we're using so many like um, JavaScript uh, centric things on the server side as well. Um, and also TV applications. A lot of TV applications that we see today are actually powered by JavaScript or the web itself. Uh, and one area that we don't really talk about is proprietary devices. Now, what do I mean by proprietary devices? I mean things like game, gaming consoles like Xboxes and also airline entertainment. Actually, just a week before I came for this conference, I was discussing with someone that's actually developing an airline entertainment, um, what's it called, module, um, feature application with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, which is cool. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago, I remember writing an exam, and I, um, it was list how many programming languages as you can, like I think five, and I put JavaScript as one of them. I think I got marked down. <laughs> JavaScript was considered a scripting language. But that's not the case today, and we could all agree on that. Uh, all right, so this is unusual. You probably don't see you know, someone speaking just telling that we're going to play a quick game. I'm going to dedicate two minutes of my time to play, to play a quick game. Now, I want you to go on this particular website, on your phone, on your laptop, or wherever. If you've got like an um, internet module in your brain, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> just go to sli.do. And as soon as you get there, it's going to ask you for event code. And you just put mix, right? And when you put mix, don't answer any questions. Just go there. Anybody running into any problems? Yeah. But yeah, sli.do. I can't and enter to submit. Say that again? I can't enter to submit. I have to click the join button. Sorry, I can't hear you. You can't hit enter to submit. You have to click the join button. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. I, I don't know about. Uh, has anybody gotten in successfully? Yes, yeah. Okay, good. A good amount of people. So you can still carry on. So here's the game. The game is Can You Spot the Web Application? Like, can you spot? So the first one we're going to show you is Untapped. Any fans of Untapped here? 
Any great beer drinkers? Good. Okay. All right. The second one is Luger. Now the third one is Swordkid. Any fans of Swordkid in the house? Great. Okay. And the fourth one is Slack. <coughs> like the web application Slack. And the fifth one is Visual Studio Code. So I need you to spot the web application. I, I think you're allowed to actually enter multiple. Um, there, uh, you can enter multiple um, answers as well. So I'm going to give you like 20 seconds to do that. Uh, all right. Okay, go in, go in, go in. I'm giving you my time here, guys. All right. Okay. <coughs> Ten seconds to go. All right. Okay. Shall we go to the results? Yeah. Shall we see that? Okay. So I'm just going to go out here and actually check the results. Hopefully this works. If this doesn't work, we're just going to go ahead and see that. So that's the results so far. This is live and people are still adding. So as you can see, some people think um, I'm tapped, none of them. A lot of people, a huge majority of people think all of them actually, which is bizarre. Um, <laughs> uh, work it and slap the web and Visual Studio Code. So you can see that, you know, we have a very, uh, that's, uh, this is what I want to portray. We have different people thinking, I don't think that's a web app. I think this is a web app. And that's the main thing here. So I guess this would not make sense until I actually get to my next slide, which is actually all of them were built with the web. So if you answer that, 10 points for you, no gift for you, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. But that's the whole point. And, at this point, a lot of people are like, you know, some people are answered like none of them, like at least 10%. And I'm not trying to take the piss of anybody, but it's just like, <laughs> that's just what we do. When we're using applications, we don't necessarily think, what was it built with? You know, when you go to buy a sandwich, you don't really hear the guy that, in the farm that, you know, like, that made bread or anything like that. You just want to eat a sandwich. Is it, does it taste good? Absolutely. When you go and buy a car, you don't want to know the chemistry behind the car. Does the driver, can I afford it? No. Great idea. Buy the car. This kind of thing. Um, so some of you are like, nah, that's impossible. I do not believe you. You know, it's impossible. This cannot be true. And I say to those people, just follow on a journey with me. Let me show you. Yeah. How <laughs> you know, exactly. Everybody likes. Uh, what's his name again? All right. So the thing is, it's all about devices. It is just all about devices when you talk about um, applications. You know, our apps today run on different devices. Different, so this is work you're running across different devices. But what is the difference? It is your app's functionality does not change. Only the experience change. You know, you can be like on the train using an app and you just get to your workplace and you just carry on on the desktop. You know, screen size and accessibility to your input devices matter. That's the only difference. On the desktop, you have a huge screen. On the mobile, you have just touch, and you have very in slow interaction area. On the smartwatch, you have things like that, um, very small screens. Now you have things like the Amazon Echo that don't even have screens. So you need to use voice to really interact with these things and to get what you need to get. Um, and same app, different experience. So this is Spotify running across a range of devices, from an Android device, a mobile device, tablets, you know, phones, <coughs> even a car, and even on your TV. That's the same device. Now, why it would really suck if I could create a playlist here and I went to some other device and I couldn't use that playlist. This is not what we expect. You know, I'm going to work, I'm texting this girl I really like on WhatsApp, you know, we're talking, and I go to work, um, um, on, I get on the train, I log on the Wi-Fi, I continue my tablet, and I get to work and I look at my boss is looking and I log on to web.whatsapp.com. I know you guys do that too. And I will log on the web app and I ca carry on. You know, the experience just moves and just adapts to the device that you are on. And that's what we kind of come to expect. Uh, so let's just move on. So what is the issue? Everything I've said so far probably makes a lot of sense. It makes sense to have all these applications across all these devices and being able to like uh, use them. But what's the issue? This is the problem. You know, if you are the person making that application, you are the company behind it, you have this huge problem. 
And this problem is a very um, what's it, arithmetic problem. It grows by the mice. You know, if you want to support iOS, you gotta find a guy that knows Swift, not the guy that tells you you know Swift, the guy that actually knows Swift. <laughs> and he uses Xcode, and that guy's probably gonna charge you an arm and a leg and a kidney, probably. <laughs> and he was, he doesn't want to work full time, you know, because there aren't a lot of iOS developers, so he's gotta be a contractor. And yeah, gotta pay him a lot of money. And the Android guy, you gotta find a guy that actually knows Android, not just a Java developer. So let's get that straight. And Android Studio, he's gonna want probably a leopard. You know, the web guy. He's gonna, well, he's, he's the web developers were a bit more, you know, reasonable, but still, you want a lot of money. Um, OSX, he knows Universal. Tomorrow, some guy creates this new open source project called Ubuntu OS. Now you gotta support something. Some guy makes something called Amazon Echo. You gotta support something. And the thing is, this guy, you have probably four people in this team that absolutely hate four people in this team, that absolutely hate another four people in that team, and if a boss is a guy from this team, you can't just replace them because they speak in completely different languages, different paradigms, and they don't like each other. That's the main thing. Uh, so that's a problem, uh, and it's a problem that grows with a platform that we want to support. So, and then, then this guy comes along, you know, this new manager guy, everybody knows that <laughs> That guy comes along. And the guy comes, the first thing he says, he wants to see spreadsheets. He wants to see the reports for the past 20 years, 30 years. Everybody knows that guy. You know, he just comes and starts barking orders, you know. A couple of people might get laid off, he gets the pay rise though. Um, and then he tells you there's no more budget for all those applications, you know. And he's got the backing of like the CEOs behind him. We all know that guy. And and now it's your job to go figure out how you can reuse all these teams, how you can organize them. Because if you think about it, it does not make any sense. You're all developing the same application, but you're speaking different languages. Like, that is crazy. Think about we're trying to write the same essay, but we're writing in different languages. It, it just does not make any sense. We want the same thing, but we're going about it differently. So how do we solve that problem? So this is probably you with that. Like that <laughs> <laughs> because you are completely, like, you do not know what to do with your life. <laughs> because you got a lot, you gotta pick your kid from school, you know, you gotta pay a nice Disney holiday to the lowest resort, which is very expensive. You, you gotta juggle around a lot of things, you know, you still gotta watch Arsenal win great football games, and uh, things like that. So you start asking, is there a better, more efficient way for cross-platform development, because that's the case. You want to see how you can reuse it across all of these devices, right? Uh, then you start sitting wondering about your life, to drink bleach or not to drink bleach. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, then you start thinking, you're like, wait a minute. But every one of those devices is capable of running web technologies. Every one of them has some sort of browser technology. You know, when you click on a link on Twitter, what happens? The in-app browser comes in and shows you the web page. You never leave Twitter, not anymore. Same thing on Facebook. You know, when you're on the iWatch, you can see the web. I have a Google Glass, and I tell you, sometimes, like, I'm out here uh, on the train, just, you know, like, reading tweets and everything, people think I'm going crazy. But I'm reading web, web stuff, really. Uh, the same thing for, even like, in the car, you can access everything, so you're like, hold on. All these have a common denominator which is a, some sort of technology that allows you to use web technologies. And web technologies are relatively easier to learn. Like, I can teach you HTML in a week, but I could probably spend one year and you still be writing a system without a quick learning job. Trust me, it, it, it is difficult. Uh, and web developers are everywhere. We are like available. We, we are available everywhere. Like, uh, most of the time, web, some web developers don't even know they're not web developers. There used to be a time when you'd ask someone, do you know JavaScript? Uh, yeah, but they didn't know that they didn't know JavaScript. They knew jQuery. <laughs> really? A, that was a thing. You know, okay, I need you to access this div and do that. Uh, where's the document ready you get? Like, no, I asked you to do JavaScript, not jQuery. So that's kind of where we're everywhere in different forms. So you start to say, why can't you just use the web to do everything, right? It makes a lot of sense, okay. Everything makes a lot of sense. So let's create a typical use case for this, our new company, you know? So 
we want a mobile application. We want to support iOS, Android, and for the 0 0.02 users that still have a Windows phone, you know, <laughs> that's for those guys. Uh, but we also want a web application that supports desktop web. And we also need to think about the mobile web because a lot of people would not want to download your app. Trust me, I'm from Nigeria. People do not download apps. Yeah. You know, it's just a third world thing. There's a, an app called a Zender. Well, people, it's where you use Bluetooth to send an APK. So if you download an APK, they use Zender to send that. Because, you know what? Data is expensive. People fight over data. You know, they don't want to waste their data. This is a first world, but we take data for granted. But where I come from, people actually look at data, and that's billions of people. It's expensive for them. And now we hear about PWAs, which I will get to later on. But just have that at the back of your mind. And now we have desktop applications. Because there's some people that are glued to their computers that don't have phones, you know? Just want to sit there. And they have Windows, they have OS X, and they have Linux. Because some guys will not buy a Windows machine or a Linux uh, or a Mac machine. They just want to use something called Ubuntu. I think it's, I think it's a dessert or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so you have something like that, right? This is a reasonable use case. Agreed? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and see how we can fulfill this use case. So how do we solve the mobile problem first, right? Because today most of our users are mobile. If you don't have mobile, literally go home. Like, everyone is mobile now. So, this is what we want to achieve with our mobile. The first thing is we want to make sure we code once, right? With uh, web technologies. The second thing is we want to make sure that that code we write is accessible the same way across iOS. You know, we want to make sure that this code is transferable 100% for iOS, for Android, for Windows. That makes sense. Thirdly, we want to be able to access hardware features. Today, the big problem, or one of the biggest problems in the web, is access to device feature. That's getting solved day by day. But until Google, Apple, and um, Microsoft sit on the same table and get drunk together, it's going to take a time because everybody's like, I know how to do it better, you know? That's why you have to write those things in your CSS, you know? Mozilla, MozKit, WebKit, everything, instead of just writing it once. Crazy, right? Exactly. And that's the main thing. So web, web apps do not necessarily have great access to um, device. If you want to take a picture with just the web today, it's still a problem. Like, you have to first detect your browser version. Oh, they're using Internet Explorer 6. I need to add 20% to their checkout so that they pay for the support. Yeah. <laughs> there is an actual website that does that. It adds $20 to your checkout if you're using Internet Explorer 6. It pays for the support. <laughs> and we want to make sure the code we use to access the device feature is also consistent across all these platforms. Um, so that makes sense, right? Everybody agree? All right. So, how do you do that? And that's where you introduce Cordova. Now, what is Cordova? Okay, let's see what Cordova is. The features of Cordova. Cordova was originally called PhoneGap originally, um, when it was created in around 2010, 9, 8. It's between 2008 and 10 by a group of guys in Canada, a company called Nitobi. And they created PhoneGap, and then Adobe came and bought it, so they donated the code and named it Cordova. Now, PhoneGap is more like the Adobe-owned version of Cordova, which Cordova still powers. Cordova is now open source and part of the Apache Foundation. Um, it bridges the gap between the web code that you write and the device features. So now you solve that problem. Um, and it supports all major mobile operating systems. And it has a plugin interface. That's how you use to get access to the camera, the Bluetooth, or anything you want to write. So some of you might say, that problem is solved, right? Not really. Actually, let me disappoint you for a bit. This is what you forget. Every single mobile operating system has a different UI library, right? Material design for Android. I don't know what the iOS one is called. I think it's UI Kit or something like that. And Windows one uses the Metro interface, and they're all different, you know? And users experience, user experience is different across these mobile devices. The animations are different. On iOS, I can drive from the left-hand side to go back and drag a page. I cannot do that on Android. That's not what an Android developer or a phone owner is used to. Um, some devices have back button. That's a big problem that people forget. On Android, you have a physical back button. And when you tap that back button inside an app, you expect something to happen. On iOS, iOS users are probably looking at me like, what am I saying? Because you have one button. Well, now you actually don't have any other 
Isaac has, has no boxes now, right? Congratulations. <laughs> 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 they, they, they took out the, the, the earpiece hole, and now they take, soon they'll take out the screen, and people will still buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't forget tablets and tablets. Tablets, we know what they are. Tablets are those ridiculous phones that, you know, uh, <laughs> some people, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, have really huge hands because they can't use normal phones, so they get the in between. <coughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but you have tablets uh, as well. Uh, so, how do you reuse a disk? You know, this is an extra level of abstraction. And this is where we can actually visualize the issue here. So, in a native application, you have all these great features. You know, when you create any native developers in the house, Exactly. So you have all these like the the kits, the SDKs come with animations, tags, boxes. You have you don't have to create anything. But on the web, what do we have? Spam, bins, tables if you still use them, you know, <laughs> things like that. And a typical Cordova application. So this is how you you have direct access to the uh, in a native native application. You have direct access to the device features like the camera, the NFC, and all those. Things. But in a Cordova application, you have Cordova that helps you bridge that gap. On top of Cordova, you have the web view. The web view is a native component that serves web content. When you click a link on Twitter, what happens? A web content shows up, something pops up inside Twitter. That is a web view. And inside the web view, you write your HTML, very ridiculous HTML code. And then that is how you then create what you call a hack application. So there's still a lot missing. The problem is your HTML code now is just one code. For you to support Android, iOS, and the different experiences, you have to do a level of abstraction that is not available in the web. You know, if I write a div, it's going to look the same across whatever device I'm on. But the users expect some sort of different. They need to see what they're used to with native. And how do you start ask yourself that question? And this is where Ionic comes in. What is Ionic? Now, Ionic is a web SDK for creating mobile applications. So Ionic is sort of like a bootstrap that sits on top of that stack that then gives you this reusability. It allows you to write one component, but that component, depending on what platform it's on, it will automatically change and adapt and look like what the user is, is expecting. Uh, it's open source. Uh -oh. uh, it's built with web technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so keeping everything consistent. Um, and it supports Android, iOS, and Windows Universal as first class citizens. Uh, so this is the Ionic stack. You write your code, and you use Ionic to write your code. And then Ionic is built on top of Angular. So you can still use any of the Angular features. So from the white plane, you can reach upwards. And then that sits within your web view, which then sits between what I call a native container, right? And then Cordova is what gives access to the native container, then you can actually seek to take a picture with a camera, with GPS, and all these things. And this might be a bit confusing, but we're actually going to touch that a little bit. And so what are the features of Ionic? Superb cross-platform components. Now this is the same exact code running in an Ionic application, but you can see how it looks different. On iOS, it looks different, material design, everything, even as, lit, uh, as, as low level as the icons, they all look different with the same exact code running. Uh, powerful icons library is very customizable and configurable. Uh, it has a first class CLI tool. We know how CLIs are very important now. I don't like to do anything with Webpack. I don't even know what Webpack is. I just think Shell Larkin is cool, that's about it. Uh, and you do, it does everything for you. Code bundling, tree shaking, AOT building. Uh, and some of the features we're not going to talk about, right to left support because we forget like a billion people in the world read from right to left. Uh, interna uh, internationalization for multilingual uh, lingual applications and cloud tools for support. So who's using Ionic? Over 4 million apps have been generated from the CLI since 2013. 110 plus countries have communities, uh, 13,000 Slack members, um, active forum and Stack Overflow. Uh, 30,000 stars on GitHub is actually the number one TypeScript project in the world. Uh, companies include Microsoft, Airbus, Diesel, Dow Jones, and we have apps like Swerkit, who have 22 million users. You know, um, Microsoft just built that. Untapped is an Ionic application. 
uh, we can see the Dow Jones Market Watch. That's an ionic application. So normally when people see new technology, they want to know who the people was using it. I think it doesn't get bigger than that. <laughs> Microsoft's using it. Um, all right, so let's get started, right? So much talk, Sani. Now walk the walk. Okay, to get started with Ionic is just literally four commands. We install Ionic, we start an application, you seed into the application, and you serve it. Let's go and see that. So this is where we go. I'm gonna turn into a white walker now. I'm just gonna make sure. <laughs> yes. Right. So let's do that. You don't know, you know nothing. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna exit this, and I'm gonna go to my desktop. By the way, in case you see any interesting like notifications that I haven't disabled, I'm apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> so let's just make this a bit bigger. Can everybody see that? Everybody see that? Bigger? Bigger. Okay. Bigger. Okay. <laughs> So let's go back to my desktop. I'm in my desktop. By the way, I can't say desktop. It's a Nigerian thing. I say desktop. So if you ever say desktop, I mean desktop. Okay. So let's go to my desktop. <laughs> um, so we're going to say Ionic start because I already have Ionic installed, of course. I'll, I'll, it will be true. Ionic start. What do we name our application? Let's name it Mix. Huh? Or let's just say NG Mix. And then you can actually put, this is the name, the folder that you'll be created. And you can also add, actually add what I call a, a template name. Uh, so let's actually add a template name. So I'm just gonna use the blank template because they have different ones. They have a, a side menu, uh, a tab, and let's hope you know, the internet does not disappoint us today. Not today, internet. Uh, now different types of templates, but we're just gonna use a blank application here. So let's just wait for the NPM install to finish. And here we go, very quick. So now we actually see it into ng mix, right? And I'm just gonna run this command called ionic lab and hit enter. So this is just gonna do the whole building for us. It's gonna talk to Sean Larkin and do some webpack, do all of that for us. And voila, we have our application. Can everybody see this or do I make it bigger? Visible? Everybody visible? Yeah. Oh, we can make it a bit bigger. Okay. And we have a now app running already. What I can go ahead and do is do this guy. Uh, okay, maybe I should make it smaller. And do this guy. And we've already created three applications. We haven't even looked at the code yet. But we have three applications running automatically. And that's pretty cool. And you can see, can anybody see any differences? Any differences? Anybody? On size. On size. On size, great. Status bar at the top. Status bar, yes. Title layout. Yes, title layout. And this is this is just you, like if you you're used to an Android device, you know that our titles are on the left. If you're used to iOS, you're used to that font size, that font face, and that alignment. So everything is different. And if you still have a Windows phone for whatever reason, <laughs> exactly, you should be used to that. I think so. Okay. <laughs> so let's go ahead and create something cool, right? Let's create a cool, very cool application. Here's what I'm going to go ahead and do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, open up the code here. Um, so I'm just going to open ng mix here. I'm going to open it on Visual Studio. Wow, that is a terrible icon. Why did they change it? <laughs> right? This is visible to everybody? Yes. Perfect? Okay. So this is the, the code we're looking at, the Ionic code we're looking at. So let's actually go ahead and do this. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and open up the source folder here in the pages. And I'm just going to say, let's name our application. What do we name our application? Anybody? Well, let's name it Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's, let's actually call it Hogwarts. Hogwarts. I think that's how you spell Hogwarts. So. So if I go back, you can see automatically it already changes, they have that server for So here's what Hogwarts is going to be. I, I have this server running somewhere called my JSON. Uh, I have this server with some information here. So let me actually um, go to JSON viewer so that I can actually showcase this. So I have this, ooh, okay. Oh, 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 oh. 
know what, I think, uh, oh, okay, I see the problem here. There we go. So we can see this structure. I have this <coughs> list of sites in uh, Israel, which is one of my favorite countries to visit, actually. Really, really nice place if you haven't been there. And I have these list of sites that I have there. So let's see how we can display this site. What would be the first thing we'll do? We'll try to do something like a, um, a template, right? Okay, so I would actually just go to the Ionic documentation here. And this is what I always do, and I advise you to do. Basically, go to the docs and copy. Literally, there's nothing better than that. And we go to the UI component. So what I want to use is, I want to use a card here. And we can just go to card with image. So I want to do something like this, right? Where I have an image for the site and the name of the site. Makes sense? Looks pretty? Okay, so let's go and achieve this. So I'm just going to take this little thing here. And I'm just going to take that. <coughs> and I'm going to go back to the code. And I'm just going to paste this here, right? And of course, um, I don't have this. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to query that server. So let's do that quickly. The first thing we want to do is we want to go to the app here, uh, app module.ts. We want to add our, so this is still an Angular application. We want to add in our um, HTTP module. So we want to say from Angular. So we want to add in the HTTP module here just to make sure that we can actually use HTTP. So we want to go to imports here and add that module, right? Everybody following? This is pretty cool, right? Okay, so normally we create a service, but I ain't got that kind of time. So I'll just do the, thing, the, the way you're not supposed to do, you know? I'm just gonna come in here, I'm just gonna import the HTTP service from um, Angular HTTP. I'm just gonna import the HTTP service, and in here I'm just going to create. Um, also, also, what I probably want to do is uh, import um, RxJS. Uh, I think it's add, and then I think it's operator, and then I'll get the map operator. This this looks right, and I want to import from RxJS uh, observable. Yeah, by the way, if I'm not getting these parts wrong, anybody can really feel free to correct me. I think this is a part for observable. Um, right, yep, okay. So in here, I'll just um, inject this guy here, uh, private HTTP as HTTP. And I'm not using HTTP client for a reason because some people are, haven't still made the move to HTTP client, so that might confuse them. But everybody knows how to use the normal HTTP. Uh, so. Yeah, and in here I'm just going to create a public observable called, uh, let's say, <coughs> site, right? Um, and this is of type observable any. Uh, observable, okay, so for some reason. I think you actually have to do the brackets. Oh, yeah. no, you're doing the, maybe you're going to write the strictly bracket. Oh, there's too many people, sorry? Strictly bracket by your import and say, Observable on line seven. Uh huh. So that's strictly bracket before. Oh, 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 of course. Yeah. Thank. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Observable from observable. Line right? six yeah. as well. Say that again. Line six. Is oh no, that's an uh, operator. <laughs> Say that again. From. Yes. <coughs> from observable. So we're good now, right? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. I got confused there for a bit. So what do we want to do? We want to make that HTTP request, you know, do the things we're used to. So we want to say this dot um, <coughs> site equals, because that's an observable, so we want to say this dot HTTP. And we want to query our little server here that I have running, right? Mm -hmm. uh, get. We want to make a get request, and we want to pass that. Um, uh -oh. um, string. Of course, as a string. <coughs> We want to make that get request, and we want to do this uh, dot map. We just want to make sure the data is data.json. We, would we wouldn't need to do this if you were using the HTTP client. So we want to do data.json. And just some indentation. This looks cool, right? We have an observable of sites, right? Everybody fine with that? So now we need to just go ahead and see how we can actually consume this observable. So of course, we would have something like this, and then G4 equals 
you know, you can say left sides of, you know, left side of uh, sides, and then we want to pass it an async pipe because we're dealing with an observable, so we want to say async. Look good so far? Everybody follow it? <coughs> okay. And now let's go back to our property here. We were interested in the name and the image, so we want to use side.image and side.name. Make sense? Okay. So for the source file, we want to bind this, and this is just Angular running. So you want to say side dot image, and here in the title, we just want to say side dot name, and then this guy, we can actually just comment this guy out, yeah. and we can save that. So let's go ahead and see what we have. Voila! We have a great application right now. And you can see differences. You can see the card sizes, everything, the shadows. So Ionic is, even the font sizes are different because Ionic already knows what it should look like on each platform. And these are beautiful places. If you ever go to Hogwarts in Israel, <laughs> you can go to some of these. I've been to some of these places. They're absolutely awesome. The Dead Sea is real. Like, you can't sit. You cannot sit. Trust me. So you do that. So now we've actually gone ahead and, and done this. So we can actually go back to our slides which if I can actually find, and so we can go back here uh, because we're running out of time. So we can see this has been solved. Everybody agree that we solved our mobile problem, right? Because we, what I can actually do is I'll do something here. Uh, um, um, let me do something while I'm going. Um, so I can go to Visual Studio Code. I can open up the terminal here. And because I already have Xcode installed, I can say Ionic Cordova run iOS. And that will go ahead and build this application and run it on iOS emulator, which will take 607,000 years. So we can just go back and um, carry on with what we're doing. Right? Uh, so now we've solved this. So let's solve web now. And for the web, it's actually pretty easy. It's all about adapting to screen sizes. And you also need to consider the mouse input and stuff like that. And you don't forget about accessibility. Do not forget about accessibility. So let's see this in action, right? So you would think that we already have the web solved. But the problem is, if we go to our application, and we take this guy here, you know, and we go here, and we open our application here, we're going to see this guy. Nobody likes this guy. Everybody hates this guy. Don't you hate it when you go to websites and you see this? It frustrates people. So we need to fix this problem here. And this is probably where I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to just copy some from my, my demo code. Um, um, so I'm just going to copy a, a little bit of shortcut, uh, a little shortcut here. Um, and oh, actually, I don't need to copy it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Ionic grid system to make this a bit more responsive. So Ionic has a grid system. Um, so we can say Ionic grid, uh, and we can make a row here. And inside that row, we can make a column, Ionic column. And this is a grid system that uses um, um, what's it called the CSS flexbox property. So we can then put this inside here, but we need to adapt to different screen sizes. So this is probably where, like I said, I'm going to cheat because we are running out of time. So I'm just going to copy this bit here. Um, I'm going to just take this guy, um, just to speed up our time. And I will explain what I did there. Um, so what I'm saying is, on a small screen, an extra large screen, take three spaces. So the grid is 12 spaces base. So we're going to have four. Three, three, three. Three times four. Uh, three times, yeah, four is 12. And then on the large screen, you take four spaces, so you're going to have three. On the medium screen, like a tablet, you're going to take six spaces, so you're going to have two, because six times two is 12. On the small screen, just take the whole thing, because screens should show one. And if you don't have anything, default to 12. Everybody cool with that? Okay. So now we're just going to take our code here, and uh, we're just going to take this guy here, um, copy him, then comment him. Okay, we shouldn't probably do that. We should just take him out here, Put it inside here, and then we're going to take the ng4 and make sure we're actually looping over the columns, not the card, or else we end up with just one row. So if we save this guy here, and let's actually go back to our, oh, an Ionic has broken. And I know this particular problem very well because it is a bug I have filed. We just need to open this, 
and restart it, and the magic will happen. <laughs> yes, it's a bug app file which nobody has fixed. Uh, so, come on, come on, we do not have time. Uh, all right. Okay, so we're back to normal, right? We see our iPhone. We've already seen this, right? So now if we go back to that guy that we do not like, which is this guy here, and we refresh, what do we see? Magic. The guardian of the you know? We see some magic. So what do we do now? Let's go ahead and test this guy. So we go back to our small screen. We use you on the tablet. We see two. Much more user experience. I'll give these guys my money now, you know? And we go here, a large screen. We see three spaces. And if we go to a super extra large screen, and this is a huge screen using 1080 TV, you can see how it takes four spaces. So now we actually solved that particular problem. Um, and if I actually go back here, um, so yeah, we're just gonna run this guy again because he couldn't find what emulator to use. Um, so let's go back to the slides now and see. Okay, so now we've actually solved our problem, right? Our web problem. But no, we haven't. <laughs> what about progressive web applications, PWAs? Now, what are PWAs? In short, a PWA is a progressive web application. is an app that works offline. Like, there's 1,000 things, but it's just a mobile web application that can work offline. You can install it on your mobile phone, like normal. You have a splash screen, an icon, and all of that. It will run in full screen. And thanks to the service worker and manifest of Jason makes that possible. So this is the state of offline today. We've sent men to the moon, you know. We have invented artificial intelligence. We have eradicated smallpox. Yeah. Yet, this is the best thing you see when you don't have internet. <laughs> that is the best experience you can see when you do not have internet. That is shocking in 2017. We need to fix that. So how do we fix that? This is what the service worker does. The service worker is a new browser standard that sits in between your app and the server. So it proxies every single request. That way, when a request comes back, you can cache that request. But you can also initiate a request because the service worker lives independently of your app. It's a system level uh, process. So even when your app is closed, the service worker is still alive, running. It's got nine lives. And you saw the live <laughs> problem. Does anybody know what Li-Fi means? <coughs> Li-Fi is when you have two bars and your phone is telling you have service, but it doesn't know what it's doing. It's just looking for service. That's the life fi It's lying to you. <laughs> so let's see this in action, right? Let's see how we can solve this problem. Okay. So I know we have, I'm kind of rushing all over a little bit because we're kind of running out of time. So how do you solve this problem? Ionic by default, when you start an Ionic application, what happens is that Ionic actually gives you a service worker by default. It's already there. And if we actually go to our index.html here, we can actually just go there and we can comment these lines here. We can remove this guy and remove this guy and we can save this and we can rerun our application uh, here. So we can refresh this guy. And uh, if we go to inspect element and we go to application, we can actually see service worker and we can see that a service worker has actually been installed. Now, here's what I'm gonna do so very, very bold. I'm actually going to be probably the first speaker you've ever seen that turns up his Wi-Fi while live on stage. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to do that. Uh, and I'm actually going to show you, let me try to go to rubbish. Okay, I shouldn't be Just go to come with work. Uh, and you know, I can play this guy. If you can beat my high score, by the way. Uh, but when I go back to our application and I refresh this guy, our app still launches live. We're offline. But we can still see this guy. How cool! This is really, really cool, I think. Because now, think about all those videos, all the Netflix, if you're offline, you can still watch it. That is pretty cool. And this is not a joke, like, we still have the dinosaur playing. Like, it's still running. But if we refresh this guy 700 times, he will always give us the last cached pictures and images of data. And that is really cool. This is what we should have in 2017. You know, exactly. So, now if we rush back to the slides, It's safe to say we've solved our web problem. Agreed, everybody? Agreed? Okay. Now let's solve desktop. Okay. About desktop applications. Desktop applications actually have a lot in common with web apps because they have huge screen sizes. 
you have some noticeable new differences. Offline is a must for desktop. If you can't use Photoshop offline, like go home. <laughs> OS X, Windows, Linux also have different skins. So how do we solve that? How do you ensure reuse between these platforms? Um, introducing Electra. Yeah. Any Electron fans in the house? Good. Exactly. So what is Electron? Very simple. It is just a code of a desktop. Like, seriously. It's open source. It supports cross-platform desktop development. And it uses web technologies. And it supports OS X, Linux, and Windows. Uh, some Electron apps you already use today. Visual Studio Code and Slack are built with Electron. It's crazy. You're using an app built with the web to write web applications. Nuts. <laughs> It's crazy. Uh, let us see this in action, right? Anybody want to see this? Cool. So I'm just going to do this where I'm just going to go to, uh, OK, I need to go back to the internet now. I, I can't do this one offline. It's impossible. Uh, yeah. So I'm just going to say Electron. So if I actually go to Electron, you're actually going to see this where um, it just um, it says to get started, you should just go to this quick start demo here. Uh, so, yeah, here, here's where we're gonna go. We're gonna go to github.com/slash/restart-election. So we're just gonna go to the Electron GitHub page and follow there. So it just says you need to clone this repository, cd into this, npm install, blah 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 blah. So I'm just gonna actually just download the zip file here, and I'm just gonna show this in the Finder. And I'm gonna open that zip file, and I'm just gonna take this zip file and put it in my, what's it called? Desktop. Um, desktop. Um, so let's see, Electron. Oh, this is the one we're looking for. So let's actually name it uh, Mix Electron, you know, so that we know what we're doing. So let's actually open that project. Uh, running out of time. Let's open that project quickly and see what we need to do. So with Electron, it actually is very similar to Codeover, where it has this main.js file that allows you to point to a particular path that you want to use. In our case, we want to point to our Ionic application, correct? So we're going to do this. We're just going to go back here, and we're going to enter uh, ng mix, and we're going to go to the www folder here, and we're going to go into the the build for, um, so we're just going to point it to this index.html file inside that www folder. Make sense? Everybody okay? Okay. So if we actually now do this and we save, we can actually go ahead and follow the instructions here. We can say, uh, do an npm install and just start the application. So let's go ahead and do that quickly. Uh, let's do an npm install so that uh, Electron gets what it needs. And that should be pretty quick because it's like, Three things, I think. Okay. Please do not, do not break now. Do not break. <laughs> I, I promise you I'll take you to Taco Bell. Do not break now. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. So, okay, pretty good. So it says run npm start. So let's run npm start and see this in action. So we run npm start, and what do we see? This is a desktop application running our app, like you can actually see. And we can still do what we have been doing. And the great thing with desktop applications is you don't have to skin them because you know people don't really care as much as they expect. So like with the web, right? So this would look the same on Windows and on Linux, but you still have electron to do all you need to do. We're still writing one code. No if and else's. So let's quickly rush back to the slides now. Um, so we're just going to go back to the PowerPoint. And at this point, we solve everything. That's pretty cool. Like, whenever I do this, like, this is how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is fire time. Like, right. I thought like, that was really, really cool because we don't all of that. Uh, you know? So, other things to be aware of uh, as I'm running down the time there's something called Stencil J. Yes, being launched by the Ionic team that allows you to generate your own web components. So you can use this as open source because the next version of Ionic is going to be framework agnostic and you can use Ionic across jQuery if you like. Because yeah. It's just pure web component. It's available for play today and this means increased performance and no need to be framework. You know, we don't need to kill ourselves because we're using React or Arduino or Beam 
or something like that. And Ionic Pro is sort of like their tools that you can use. There's something called Ionic Deploy that allows you to update your app live on the App Store without going through the App Store. So you can update your users or give different versions of your app to different users without using the App Store. Apple doesn't have to take 30% anymore, you know? Uh, these are my bold predictions for the web. The first thing is I think in the next year, PWAs will be accepted to the App Store. You should be able to make a web application and submit it to the Google Play Store probably first, and it will be accepted. It will be listed on the Google Play Store. The next thing is I think the JavaScript frameworks will come to an end, as we know it today. We're no longer going to be killing each other for React or Angular or Vue or Knockout or Aurelia if you use that kind of thing. You know, there will be an end to that. PWAs will make it to your Mac, Linux, and desktop. One day you'll be able to go to www.photoshop.com and you should be able to save that and it will work offline. That day is coming pretty soon. We're no longer going to do what we call desktop applications. That's going to go away. The concept of desktop applications, as we know, will be deprecated. I see that coming. Nobody will need to ship a specific EXE or whatever. That would end. The web would be. And the web will be the new native. Today, when we say native, we mean, you know, C++, stuff like that. In a few years, I feel like the web is going to be the new native. So I've just run around one minute over time. Um, I'm just going to do a bit of shameless promotion. I've just launched this project called New Project UI School. UI School. If you need, like, it's a four week boot camp online only where we teach you Angular and stuff, some of the stuff I've talked about today with Firebase. Um, you can go ahead and like sign up today. There's like a little free coupon today. So you can go to ui.school and sign that up. Um, and you can go to the Ionic site to get started, Electron.js to get started, my blog, even though I barely write on there. And you follow me on Twitter if you've got any questions. Sign user everywhere. If you see anyone using my username and you do not look like me, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end, this is where I welcome any questions. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.